Hello, everyone. How are you going today? Thank you for joining us in the Community Partnerships in Action stream. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Now, before we get into our first presentation today, we're just going to have a quick note from the sponsor of this stream, uh, Tanya Reed from Saving Our Species. Thank you, Tanya, for being with us. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians on which the land I stand today, which is Waramai land. Uh, most of you probably have heard by now the Hunter region is going into a mad snap lockdown, so it's a bit of chaos up here. Uh, but nevertheless, it's always important to, to stick to what was on the agenda today, and today it's to talk about community partnerships in action. Um, for those who aren't familiar with Saving Our Species, we are the New South Wales government's flagship uh, conservation framework and we partner with over 200 partners across the state. Landcare groups form a huge part of that contribution. Uh, we have 25 partners actively working towards 16 projects uh, and without them we wouldn't be able to meet uh, the, the amazing conservation outcomes that we have achieved over the past five years. But we're thrilled to announce that the program will still be going ahead following the announcement early last month. Uh, and so we look forward to another five years of working together. If you want to know anything further about the, the program, I encourage you to go to Saving Our Species uh, via Google. <laughs> uh, and I'll throw over to the pres presenters today. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Tanya, for that. And thank you so much for saving uh, to Saving Our Species for sponsoring this stream. It's fantastic. And I'm so incredibly excited uh, to get through all the amazing content that we have coming today and tomorrow uh, for you. Now, I should also say that I'm coming to you from Gadigal country uh, of the Uri Nation. Um, I'm here in Sydney at the ICC. Uh, land was never ceded and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Now, for our first presenters today, we have Kim Thompson and Robin Harding from the Upper River Torrens Landcare Group. And they will be presenting uh, to us uh, a presentation entitled From Little Things, Big Things Grow about the establishment of uh, the Habitat Recovery Alliance project. And that's a fantastic initiative that had an amazing amount of traction. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for that introduction. Welcome, everyone. Our presentation today is based on the words sung by Paul Kelly back in 1993, From Little Things, Big Things Grow. But first, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Paramount people. We pay our respects to their elders, the past, present and future. And we recognize their historic and ongoing connections to this land and feel privileged to be presenting here today. We also recognize that First Nations sovereignty was never ceded. We're going to tell you a story or two about our epic land care response following the catastrophic fires of December 2019. Around 21 and a half thousand hectares were burnt in our patch, which was known as the Cudley Creek fires or Adelaide Hills fires. Our whole region, our communities, friends, families, and a significant portion of our land care catchment, the Upper River Torrens, was affected in some way. My name is Kim Thompson, and I'm a member of the Upper River Torrens Landcare Group. And it's an absolute honor to be here today to tell you our story. This picture is the entrance to Porter Scrub Conservation Park. 104 hectares of significant and ecologically sensitive area within our neighborhood. This park hosts a number of nationally endangered species and the Upper River Torrens Landcare Group have been volunteering in this park since 2012. Sadly, we lost one human life in these fires who was a well-known and respected man from Charleston. In the first few days after the fire, we checked in with our local members who'd been hit hard. We tried our best to offer moral and practical support. This was the most difficult period, particularly for those who'd lost homes and animals. Out of the ashes and almost instantly, we experienced an overwhelming response from our local community and the wider parts of the state, which we will elaborate on later in this presentation. The ability to share our formula with you on what has been a winning project is a true celebration of what we believe Landcare is and always has been about. 
the people. I'm Robin Harding, and since 2017, I've been the chairperson of the Upper River Torrens Landcare Group. I live with my lovely wife, Tiffany, who you can see on the far left of your screen there, on 22 acres in the picturesque Canton Valley, and our other faithful dog down there below called Lolly. On Thursday, the 19th of 2019, the CFS issued a catastrophic fire danger rating for the Mount Lofty Ranges. Then on Friday the 20th, just after 9am, I received a message that an uncontrolled fire had broken out in Cuddly Creek, just below the Millbrook Reservoir in the top left of your screen. Within four hours, the fire had reached the townships of Loverthor, Woodside and Charleston, some 15 kilometres away from the ignition point and four and a half kilometres to the south of our property. Then at around 4.30, a thunderstorm system hit the, hit the fire ground, providing further complications to the firefighters. This swung sections of the fire front around a full 180 degrees directly back at us. It was at this stage, I was standing on the highest vantage point of the property, and I knew we had less than 30 minutes before the fire front would be upon us. At 5 p.m., the fire struck our property, thankfully, no longer fanned by the strong gusting northerlies. We saw the flames creeping across the paddock from the south, hitting the southern boundary shelter belt. The shelter belt seemed to slow the fire considerably as it stayed there for what seemed like an eternity. Apparently, because the shelter belt lacked the middle story with only pulse grazed grasses underneath, the flames never reached up sufficiently to ignite the canopy. Eventually, the fire moved out from the shelter belt across the recently slashed horse paddocks towards the house and the garden. And after an initial panic upon seeing the flames, the horses seemed to settle down and stood quietly in a small irrigated area whilst I kept the flames away from them with the fire hose. Tiff and I then spent the next six hours fighting the fire with all the hoses we had, the garden hoses, buckets, and even fire extinguishers. The fire would come in from one direction, we'd get that under control, and then it would swing around to the other direction, and then it would light up some other part of the property, and it would keep coming at us from all different directions. Finally, at around 11 p.m. at night, the property was fully burnt everywhere, and we sat down on our lawn and had a refreshing drink and a much needed rest. The experience was eerie. The fires glowing all around us in the trees, the structures on the hillsides and the sound of explosions as fires devastated other properties around us. Although the main charge of the fire was pulled up in 24 hours, we continued to have restless days and nights for the next 10 days due to the flare ups. But finally, on the 3rd of January 2020, the fire was finally described as safe. In the days after the fire, it seemed that half the district birds were taking refuge in the oasis of our garden. Most of the regular wrens, the honey eaters, the magpies, they seemed largely unperturbed by the fire. We had two koalas that now settled into the uh, property as well. Two weeks later, we received 60 odd mil of rain that resulted in the most remarkable transformation of the landscape. With large numbers of hardened bergias popping up where we've never seen them before, apparently triggered by the heat of the fire. The acacia pycnantha seedlings had sprouted and many of the badly burnt grevilleas were reshooting from the base, as did the Christmas bush, which was kind of ironic. And of course, the eucalyptus were reshooting madly. We're generally very pleased with how well our property survived the fire and suspect that that was partly due to a good location and aspect, but largely due to good preparation and sound land management practices. Whilst we defended our home, horses, cows and chickens miraculously, we did sadly lose most of the native animals, including the friendly koala we had, and lots of native vegetation and revegetation that we had spent the last 26 years planting. However, this was all put into perspective when we later learned that one life was lost, 21,000 hectares were burnt, 98 dwellings and 542 sheds, outbuildings, along with vehicles, and destroyed an untold number of native wildlife. I too live local and my family evacuated twice during these fires. Thankfully, our home and small property were not impacted. However, I have been an animal rescuer for the past 30 years and immediately deployed to help nurse and care for some of the native animals who were impacted by this fire. My heart began to hurt. And there are some images that you can't get out of your head. 
You can't unsee or unsmell them once you've been through this. Animal rescue during these catastrophic fires is tough. I was doing what I could. I cared for many koalas and possums and helped out other carers during the rehab. We did have some wins, but not surprisingly many losses and some very sad stories. In addition to the people, property and animal losses was the wildlife habitat and veg communities that were lost. And as we know, habitat restoration takes many years. So there was no time to waste. On the 27th of December, seven days after the fire began, I sowed two trays with managum seeds, Eucalyptus viminalis, our Southern koala's favorite food. And of course, other species like possums love them too. Well, that was a start. I was also thinking of our other land care members who weren't affected and who might be in a position to help out in the nursery. By golly, we were gonna need all the help we could if we wanted to start repairing our land and helping out our fellow land carers. As secretary of the Upper River Torrens Land Care Group and novice administrator of Facebook, I posted this. Feel like doing something useful to help our fellow land care members? Start sowing natives. And the power of social media, it did its thing. Our local farmer's market manager, who is definitely not a novice in social media and has thousands of followers, she shared our post. And by January, within two weeks of the fires, we'd received over 730 emails asking how, when, where could they help with the recovery. This is our treasurer, Matt Sharp, and his lovely wife and one of his kids who stepped up and started prepping seedlings for what would eventuate into a mammoth recovery project. How were we going to respond with this many emails? How can we capture the interest and energy being offered by people we didn't know? What happened next was the beginning of a whirlwind 18 months of community action. A group of like-minded people and organisations from within our local community came together to develop a strategy and a plan about how and what we could do to support the restoration and recovery. And that was the beginning of the Habitat Recovery Alliance. We pulled some startup funds and we hired that farmer's market manager to connect with all of those people. We didn't want to lose them whilst we worked out how on earth we could capture, utilize, engage and mobilize these people offering to help. We needed to maintain the momentum and get the community involved and contributing in a practical way to bushfire recovery. So how could we do this? Well, as a species, humans have always had a fundamental need to connect. So we came up with a great initiative that gave all the people who wanted to help a practical way to get involved. Grow your own box. Nursery workshops facilitated by the Habitat Recovery Alliance the volunteers were held at the local Mount Pleasant market every Saturday during February 2020, of which there were five for that month. Volunteers were allocated time slots to participate in short demonstration training sessions held by a very own committee member, Steve Anderson. They then moved to a bench where they pricked out the seedlings that were in trays and put them into individual tubes. They fertilized and watered their plants. They wrote their own plant labels and they took them home to love, care and nurture for them until they were strong and healthy and we were ready for planting. Three months later, over two days, due to COVID-19 once again, we scheduled all the volunteer growers, all 237 of them, to bring back their trays and seedlings. The logistics of coordinating and scheduling all of this was largely through the assistance of our recently employed administration support officer. And at the end of the day, we had amassed a whopping total of 16,500 tube stock. 237 volunteer growers, 170 volunteer planters, 16,500 tube stock and over 1,000 volunteer hours, an epic effort, I'm sure you'd all agree. Halfway through the project, we received funding support from Landcare Australia and Lockheed Martin, a global aerospace and technology company. 
This enabled us to deliver targeted bushfire recovery works across 13 properties, including weed control, site preparation, planting, and guarding of the volunteer grown tube stock. Planting began not quite as we expected, once again due to good old COVID-19, but successfully with boots on the ground support from the Upper River Torrens Land Care Group volunteers, who I'd like to take this opportunity and thank them for their phenomenal support and remind them that we are all volunteers. We're unpaid, yes, but not because we are worthless, but because we are all priceless. Habitat for Humanity helped on the bottom left of the screen. They were absolutely amazing as well. And the volunteers from the corporate companies I previously mentioned had provided us with funds. The Rotary Club of Onkaparinka, the Gummeracker and Tea Tree Gully Men Shed in the top left of the slide helped build the nesting boxes. Staff from the RNRM boards to assist batching of the tube stock. And the local tradie, Philip Cornish in the top middle of the slide helped install 45 nesting boxes. And finally, the contributions from the local and wider community were amazing. We knew we needed to continue in our recovery efforts. And thankfully, year two funding support came from WISE and Landcare Australia. So we've worked with another four landholders. We've planted another 5,000 tube stock and we've engaged a lot more volunteers. We've also leveraged additional funding support from Landcare Australia through corporate volunteer days with Country Road and Shep staff coming out on the ground. We've had support from Conservation Volunteers Australia and Vinpac, a local company from the Barossa. We've worked with students from two schools, New York to High School and the Borders from Seymour College. It's been hectic, exhausting, but so very rewarding. Every single person who got involved has experienced a sense of achievement and the opportunity to do something practical to support bushfire recovery. Since the fires, we've coordinated over 25 events. We've engaged over 600 volunteers, 285 volunteer growers and 350 planting volunteers. We've produced 23,000 tube stock and we've contributed in excess of 1,600 volunteer hours, which equates to over $70,000. A huge success story. Thanks for letting us brag. So what were some of the highlights and opportunities that came about? Well, as Kim previously mentioned, two schools got involved in the project. One, Seymour College, a year 12 student, Claire Langley on the left of the screen, she pestered us for weeks. She had recently joined Trees for Life and wanted to grow plants for our project and wanted us to tell her what to grow. Eventually we caught up with Claire and Seymour College ended up growing around 700 plants of which have recently been planted. The highlight for us was Claire and 15 other students coming out onto site to plant seedlings that they had individually grown from seed themselves. Year nine ag students also from New York for High School they collected seed and grew around 500 plants, which they got to plant on site as well. Another highlight was the networks and alliances that evolved from the embryonic stages of the project. We have now developed strong linkages with local companies and increased our land care group by 30 plus members, some outside of our actual catchment, including, which is fantastic now, one new committee member. One opportunity that now stands out is our increased ability of leveraging, leveraging additional funding and subsequently increasing our future project portfolio, which in turn adds value to our projects. And as you will all know, everyone wants to be associated with those who are making a difference. So as, you fin as we finish our presentation today, we'd like to share some of our success, like how did we do it? Forming the Alliance, the HRA, and providing clarity on who will coordinate actions. This was pivotal in the success because it gave everyone who wanted to be involved an opportunity to contribute skills, resources, resources and professional support, such as administration, marketing, finance governance, and on-ground project management. Our win was early on with the administration team who were able to capture the energy and build a database. This is our best tool, and there is no way we could have been able to do it without this, without their help. 
Like never before, we really utilise the power of social me media to our advantage. So our advice is, if you don't know how to use it, find someone who does and get them to teach you. And the best part, it's free. <laughs> we used it to promote our funding partners, share stories, invite the community to our events and acknowledge our very important volunteers. You need to actively engage with the people that are around you. You've got to keep that momentum and the energy going with both the community and the funding bodies. Invite them to join in, but not all the time. Update them with photos about how the project is progressing and remind them that their contribution is making a difference. Encourage them to stay connected. We use MailChimp and Eventbrite, all free platforms, perfect to keep our supporters involved. So yes, share your success and invite everyone to participate. We keep in touch with those 700 plus people who made that original contact 19 months ago, and we are still inviting them to bushfire recovery events. Remember, shout it out from the rooftops. Let everyone know what your message is. And finally, make an impact. Provide meaningful engagement and real experiences. Facilitate those connections. For example, when we work on a bushfire affected property, we always ask each landholder to recall and tell their story. Of course, we warn them. This vulnerability is always felt by the volunteers helping on the day and helps them connect to what they're actually doing. The nursery workshops provided a practical and one-off opportunity to contribute. And many have completed two years of volunteer growing and have even been out on site planting. This has been our story. Thank you to Landcare Australia and the organisers of this event and for giving us the opportunity to share our story. We hope you enjoyed our presentation and you, your family, your friends, your community can now see that from little things, big things grow. Thank you. And we now open the floor to questions. Thank you so much for that. Kim and Robin, that was a fantastic talk. It's so inspiring to see all of the amazing work that was accomplished post what were some terrifying fires. Uh, it's truly inspirational. And I think you said it perfectly there um, that the work being volunteering work is not uh, because there's, they're worthless, but because it's priceless. And I, I truly believe that it's really inspirational to see all the amazing stuff that you've accomplished. Um, now we're just going to move into a couple of questions uh, before we move on to the next presentation. Um, now, if you do have a, a question, please feel free to uh, put it in the uh, box there and I will do my best to try to address some of them. Unfortunately, we are short on time. So I apologize if your question isn't uh, included in this, um, but we'll endeavor to cover off on all the, all the big uh, talking points. Um, now, we have a question coming through uh, from Susan uh, that asks, did you find uh, that the natural process of soil recovery took off before you could get any plants in and so allowed you to be more selective with planting sites? Yeah, look, that's, that's, that's yeah. definitely um, a good point, Susan. And we certainly didn't go in planting in areas where we knew there was already good remnant veg and there was going to be some good natural recovery uh, in the environment. So we were very strategic about where we planted and mostly it was in areas where nothing had been growing and there was a lot of weed control and site prep that was done prior to any planting. Obviously, we didn't have time to go into all of the details about exactly what we did. But yes, we were very mindful of the natural systems that we were working within. Thanks for the question. Fantastic. Um, and another question here uh, from Trina is, where did you source your seeds originally and how and where did the students collect the native seeds? Maybe you go for it. Thank you. Um, so we as a Landcare group have been involved in doing reveg projects for many, many years. So we already had some seed that had been um, sitting around waiting for this opportunity. So we used some of that. We also were able to source seed from our other partners in the Habitat Recovery Alliance. So the Kersbrook Landcare Group are a very active group in our area and they do a lot of uh, nursery work. So we were able to source seeds from them. 
the seed collection happened at the bush gardens, the Barossa Bush Gardens, which are two another uh, Habitat Recovery Alliance partner. And so the students from New Ripta High School went out there and, and picked seed from that site. Fantastic. We've got about a minute left here. So I'm just going to ask one final question. And this is going to be from me because I'm very keen to hear the overarching story uh, as to where you're headed. And I'd love to know where you see this project going in the future and what your ambitions are for it. I'm going to palm it back to the Okay. <laughs> so um, look, as we said in our presentation, habitat recovery uh, is a long process. It takes years. And we're still working on uh, a, pro a project at the moment. But Look, we'd love to do the same thing all again. It really is an engaging experience for people. We've had um, people who attended the first session in February, 2020. We, had, we did more nursery workshops in November, 2020 in preparation for this year's planting. And some of those people have been to all of those events. So we'd love to keep them engaged. We just need to have resources. So we'd like to do year three recovery and we just need a sponsor. Fantastic. Thank you both so much for everything today. It's been an immensely engaging talk, and I'm sure that that support will absolutely come with all the amazing work that you've done and, and proven yourselves to be able to accomplish. Uh, so no concern from my end, not being the one that can sponsor, but I'm sure those will come through. Uh, so thank you so much again for a brilliant talk. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and that it comes to a close for our first uh, talk of the Community Partnerships stream. Uh, if you tune back in in about four minutes, we'll be uh, joined with uh, Jonathan Starks, who will be talking to us about the uh, Project Hindmarsh. Thank you very much. <laughs>